you very much, JB. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jerry Bergman. I considered uh, Jerry uh, my friend, and I think a number of you probably also consider Jerry your friends as a creationist. Uh, he's always been very open to help those of us that haven't written 60 books or have a 40,000 volume library. He will, uh, uh, you know, if you're wanting to get started with, with your own creation ministry, he has all kinds of experience and he's uh, willing to help you in many different ways. Um, so uh, Dr. Jerry Bergman is a multi-award winning teacher and author. He has taught biology, biochemistry, anatomy and genetics, psychology and other courses for over 40 years at the University of Toledo, Toledo Medical College, Bowling Green State University, and other colleges. His nine degrees include a doctorate from Wayne State University in, in Detroit, Michigan. His over 1,600 publications are in both scholarly and popular science journals. Dr. Bergman's work has been translated into 13 languages, including French, German, Italian, Spanish, Danish, Polish, Czech, Chinese, Arabic, and Swedish. His books and, and books that include chapters that he's authored are in over 1,600 college libraries in 34 countries. So far, over 80,000 copies of the nearly 60 books and monographs that he has authored or co-authored are in print. So won't you please welcome Dr. Jerry Bergman. Mike, okay, okay, thank you. Very, very good to be here. I was here, I think, two years ago, and I had a great time, so I was really looking forward to coming back. So this presentation is on, let's see if we can get this to work. Uh, okay, there we go. Why is it going backwards? Okay, it's on the universe. God's plan was to create man and woman. That was his whole plan. But before he can create man and woman, he had to create a universe. Because man and woman would not have a place to live unless we had a universe. And this presentation is about the creation of the universe. So there's a lot of work to do, a lot of preparation before, indeed, Adam and Eve could be created. And research shows that we live, if you've followed some of the intelligent design stuff, research has shown that we live in a very special place in the universe. And as you do more and more research, we're understanding that that is true, which I'll show you in a minute. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And you're all familiar with this scripture, but I notice some translations include the word not heavens, but heaven. And it seems, at least from my study, that the word heaven refers to the universe. It refers to the universe. And a number of commentaries have concluded that that's what wor that word refers to, is the entire universe, the heavens, the heaven. Although many use the word heavens, but nonetheless, some very good translations uses the word heaven, singular. And you've read this many times, so Romans is a scripture that's very important because that which may be known of God manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, and the universe is a good example, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And that's from the King James Version. By the way, I've been speaking in, oh, I would say five or six hundred different churches or more. And the only complaint I had, the only complaint I had in all those presentations is, you got to use the King James Version. That's the only one. I guess I'm lucky, fortunate. That's the only one. But, so I try to use the King, which I grew up in the King James, so I don't have any problem. So uh, I switched some of my uh, translations to the King James which aren't always as easy to follow because we're not used to it. But anyways, the glory of God can be seen in the heavens. 
and the, or the heaven, the universe, you want to use that translation. So the goal was to create humans. So that was the end goal. So before God could do this, he had to create, well, a universe. But before he could create a universe, he had to create, think about this, space, time, matter, and energy. If there is no matter, there can be no energy or time or space. Now, we are so used to time and space. I mean, it's obvious there's space between me and you people. And if I wanted to walk out and say hi to Milt, it, I had to go over there to do that. There's space between us, and I have an idea of how much space there is. And it wouldn't take me but a few seconds to do that. But before matter, there would be no space, and there would be no time, because time is dependent upon matter. So these things had to be created first. And then, besides that, God had to create gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, and the weak nuclear force. So these forces had to be created first. And a good example is gravity. Gravity is a force we know it always works. At least I've never found it doesn't work. I haven't tried it that much because it always works, and so people have actually tried to find how it does not work, and we find air resistance. You know, when you drop something, it has air resistance as it comes toward the Earth. So we know those don't change gravity. They just deal with, they interfere with gravity. But gravity is still always there. And the interesting thing is, and I have a book this thick on gravity, the interesting thing is we don't know why or how gravity works. When we try to stop it, for example, we know gravity is working now. I had to overcome it to walk up to this platform. But we know it's working now, but can we stop gravity? So we'll take a big piece of lead, and then if I step on that, is gravity going to be manifest? Well, yeah, of course. If we have, what about a vacuum? We'll have a large container, and we'll make a vacuum. Is that going to change gravity? No. Nothing changes gravity, essentially. And we know that because we've tried. But gravity is an interesting force. It is so weak that to get up here, I had to overcome gravity. But yet gravity holds Pluto. We used to be a planet, the ninth planet, but it's demoted. But I guess it wasn't behaving, so it's de <laughs> demoted. Now it's just a planetoid, but it holds Pluto in orbit. And Pluto is so far away that we didn't see it until, what, 1930-something? when finally it was discovered by its influence upon other planets. So we know that. Now these, we know a lot of details about them. We have a lot of information about these forces. But again, we don't know how they work or why they work. We know they work consistently. And therefore, there are several scriptures I could get into, which basically says that gravity is, this, is a result of God's force. It's a result of God's active force on the universe. Strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, well, I'll skip that for now. Isaiah 40, 21 through 23 has been told to you, or it has been told to you from the beginning. Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in. So we live in the universe stretched out like a curtain. Now, when God created the earth, he had, to, you know, the first thing is the size, the shape, and probably looked at a flat surface like that and said, that's not going to work, because gravity pulls the whole, whole earth inward. And this part of the world, it pulls me inward. On the other side, in China, it pulls me, well, from my standpoint, upward, but from the earth's standpoint, inward. So that's not going to work. So, the result was a round earth. And a round, in, indeed, is in many ways, it's the best shape because gravity pulls the whole thing together. And when they produce ball bearings, I often wondered how they make them round. Well, if you're a, an engineer, you understand what they do is take metal, which is molten, and they extrude a small amount, and it falls through a vacuum channel, and it cools slowly as it falls it dissipates the heat and then as it gets toward the bottom it drops in oil and it becomes perfectly round and so the force pulling it together 
produces a round shape. And there the Earth must orbit the sun, and there we can see the Earth and the moon system must orbit the sun. And the orbit must be defined in certain ways, which we won't get into right now. Okay, there we go. And okay, we've got gravity, and the Earth must rotate about 24 hours. You say, well, that's, well, that's pretty obvious. Mercury, one day, day and night, is two years. So we'd have one year all black and one year light. Well, pretty much one year. Some slippage there, but you couldn't grow plants. So when God produced the earth, he, he had to figure out to grow plants, plants is the goal later on, to grow plants, we have to design the earth in a certain way so it spins, its rotation is 24 hours. And that's unusual in the universe. Well, Mars is pretty close, but many of the planets do not have a rotation rate that is accommodating to plants. And a good example is Venus is 5,832 hours. Again, it's way too long. It's not going to work. Okay, the next. Are you going to even work here? Okay, there we go. Need to protect the Earth. And there are lot of, lots of debris coming from other parts of the solar system, and the Earth must be protected. And you'll notice there's a system of planets, and you might wonder, why is Jupiter there? What's the point of Jupiter? What's the purpose? Well, it turns out that we wouldn't have life on the Earth without Jupiter and the other planets. The other planets have an important role, and that is they protect the Earth from debris coming in from other parts of the universe. And there we go. That's the moon. Look at all the craters. Fill full of craters. Now, why don't we have the same number of craters on the Earth? Well, one of the moon's functions, it has several, one of the moon's functions is to pull in debris which may normally land on the Earth. It lands on the moon, so therefore the moon is filled full of craters. We only actually have three large craters on the Earth, that's all, that they know of. Just three. The one in Arizona is by far the most famous. We have small craters, but nothing significant, and most of those land in water. Now, look at all the other planets. Look at the size of Jupiter compared to, gee, it's hard to find. Oh, there it is, compared to the Earth. The Earth is a little dot compared to Jupiter and Saturn and Uranus and Neptune. Why are all these planets so big? Why are they important? Well, again, Jupiter has enormous gravity, like a magnet, and it pulls in all this debris that would normally hit the Earth. And, of course, debris can come from the other side, so therefore we have the Mercury and Venus, which absorbs the debris coming from the other side. So there's a good reason for these planets. And now we are in the Milky Way galaxy. And there it is. And we are, our galaxy, our, sorry, our solar system is in the Milky Way galaxy right about there. Has to be in that place. If it was in almost any other location, couldn't have life on the Earth. So God had to create the galaxy and place in it that was appropriate for the Earth. They call that in chemistry and physics a sweet spot. So it's in the sweet spot. And there we can see the sweet spot better, right there it is. And we are again in the ideal place. And something else before the universe, in this case the galaxy works, is there had to be a way of keeping all the stuff in the galaxy together. The sun keeps the planets together, circling the sun. So there's got to be a, a force. And in the solar system here, what do you think that is? I asked this to a class who I was teaching in, uh, in uh, Indianapolis. And a third grader, he raised his hand and he said, there's a black hole there. I said, how do, you, how do you know that? Oh, we learned that in school here. I said, that's good to know. So many things 
in school people learn are not relevant to the world. And so it's good to know that he learned that, but that's true. There had to be a black hole there. We didn't know about black holes until a few years ago. A black hole is so large, so enormous, the gravity is so great that light cannot leave. And therefore we call it a black hole because it's black. And the gravity is so enormous that that black hole holds the whole galaxy together so it functions as a unit. And remember, we're just a small dot in that galaxy. But all of this had to be done first before man and woman were created. And besides that, there's galaxies around us. They call the local group. And here, these galaxies are all part of the local group. Now, why would all of that be necessary? Well, one reason is, is that the heavens declare the glory of God. There's got to be something out there. So I wonder, did God create all of this just so our astronomers could use their telescopes and discover all the stuff that's out there? And indeed, you know, I thought looking through a telescope would be boring. I guess it is most of the time. But people say one discovery, like a galaxy, makes a lifetime of looking through your telescope all worthwhile. And I'll give you a few examples that made people's day, um, sorry, made their lifetime. And uh, there we go. There's billions of galaxies. Everywhere we look, and all these, by the way, these are all galaxies. These look like stars, but they're not. They're galaxies. There are lots of galaxies out there. Now, atheists, of course, believe that given enough time, life will on by itself evolve, will spontaneously generate. And so they're looking for life on all these other places in the universe. We can only see so far, of course, but, but so far they've found about 500 different planets. And interestingly, none of them are suited for life. They're either too close to the sun, too far away, too large. They've got some Jupiter-sized planets that are about the same place Venus is, circling the, the sun of these other galaxies. So, so far, what we know is the only planet in the universe that can support life is the Earth. So far. Now, scientists are going to keep looking, but so far, that's what we know. And I'm not optimistic they'll find life elsewhere. Now, how is the universe held together? Well, now we know the universe is held together by not only dark matter, but also dark energy. And this picture actually shows, that's a galaxy, there's another galaxy, there's another galaxy. It shows how they're all held together by what looks like a spider web, holding all of these billions of galaxies together that looks like a spider web. Well, that looks kind of boring so far, but it gets more interesting. The habitable zone in the solar system is where we're at, where the Earth is at, right here. It would be here, it'd be too hot, here it'd be too cold. It's too cold on Mars, too hot on Venus. So it's got to be in the right place. If you've seen the movie Privileged Planet, they bring that out quite well. And uh, the Earth is a water planet. It's the only planet that has huge amounts. About two-thirds of the Earth's surface is covered with water. It's called the blue marvel, the Earth. And when we look at all the other planets, you couldn't read English, you would right away, you would see which one is the Earth. I mean, look at the difference. The other planets don't look very inviting. But look at the Earth. It's got the beautiful blue colors. It's interesting, they've done surveys of men and women too, but men, by and large, their favorite color is blue. It's mine. It's my favorite color. And how many, the favorite color is blue? They're okay, quite a few. And I wonder if that has something to do with the fact that we live on the blue planet. And there's all the planets. Okay, is it working? There we go. Nebulae. When we look through our telescopes, we are finding, well, in this case, the pillars of creation formed of gas, and galaxies, etc., and that is 
the three pillars of creation, and that is millions of light years across, or thousands of light years across, we can see. But the more interesting one is oh, this one right here. And I, when I teach in the schools, Christian schools, by the way, because of public schools, they can't teach this. But in Christian schools, I ask the students, what do you think this nebula is named? The eye of God. I say, you got it. Hey, you're almost as smart as my third graders. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but they, they usually can guess, almost always they guess the eye of God. Now, there's another name for it, but I like the eye of God. The person who discovered this didn't, couldn't sleep for a week. When he saw this and thought, that's the eye of God, and you can see in many ways it's like an eye, the center part, and of course the side part right here of the eye. So in many ways, it's just it's the eye of God. And it's blue. Hey, there we go. <laughs> that's a good observation. Now, God also had, on the earth, we're going back to the earth now, God also had to create the atmosphere. And all of these parts were necessary for life to live. Troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere. All of these were necessary for life to live on the earth. You take away any one of them, and we don't have life. Besides that, and I'll show you a few more examples, must have a sun, well, that's pretty obvious. And we have 100 trillion photons arriving every second at every square centimeter of Earth's dayside surface, or about a quintillion. 100,000 trillion photons. And the energy of those photons is just right for the needs of plants. There's a lot of suns out there that give off photons that are in a different part of the spectrum and plants can't use it. But the photons we have are designed specifically to cause plant growth. Amazing. You can see design all over the place. I'm doing a presentation now, which basically I have Gabriel and Jesus and God discussing. Well, what do we do about this? Well. We have photons here. We've got to make the sun in such a way to where the photons arriving in the earth fit the needs of plants. All these things, little things have to be thought about. Those of you who have a couple of engineers here, my uh, accommodating guest engineer, and you can't just say, well, let's see, let's build a bridge. Let's make it so long. And let's, a lot of things have to be thought of before you can build the bridge. You have to look at, I taught a course called statics once, which we use bridges to understand statics. And uh, you can see the angle of the weight is important in producing a bridge which stays up. And there you can see some of the layers again. One I'll look at is this atmospheric layers, ozone layer. If we didn't have an ozone layer, we would be killed by uh, cosmic radiation. We'd be destroyed. We have to have an ozone layer. Ozone is oxygen, but it's not O2, it's O3. And it's very effective at absorbing this high-energy, dangerous radiation from the sun. And the greenhouse effect, we hear a lot of negative things about that today, but the greenhouse effect is really important because if we didn't have the greenhouse effect, during the day our temperature would be off the charts. At night, it'd be below freezing, way below freezing way, way below freezing at night. So we have to have the greenhouse effect. It's necessary for life to live on the Earth. So that also had to be built into plans to build the Earth. And the Earth has a magnetic field called a magnetosphere, and there we can see the magnetic field. And these lines here are the lines of the magnetic field, and they have a very important function. Well, one, which we're familiar with is a compass. That's why a compass works. Some planets don't have a magnetic field, and therefore compasses would not work. Well, if they don't have life, I guess they don't need a magnetic field, but ours does because we have life on the Earth. And there's the lines. And you can see now the harmful radiation. You've 
you know, along with the bad, you've got the good. So you've got to filter out the bad. It's just like anything else. You've got you know, water, you've got to filter out the bad. You've got to take the bad out of the water. Otherwise, water will have toxins in it. So likewise, sunlight is good, but you've got to filter out the bad. You have to have the bad as well as the good because that's the nature of producing light from the sun, the core of the sun. And this sphere here, the magnetosphere, just causes the harmful radiation to go around the Earth, and by and large, it misses the Earth. You get a little bit that comes in the poles, and so you have the aurora borealis as a result of that uh, energy. So without this, life would be dead. Without all of these things I mentioned, life would not be possible. So before God could create Adam and Eve, I had to plan all these things. It was like an engineer. In many ways, they speak of God as an engineer. There are, among the creation movement, many engineers because engineers see the work that goes into something before it works and the things you have to think about before the whole thing works. And God had to think about a lot of things before he created Adam and Eve. That was the end goal. That was what he was working on. But he had to plan ahead and had a lot of things to think about. In fact, my uh, conversation I'm doing with Gabriel and Jesus and God is on dogs. Before God created humans, he had to create a companion. Well, we have men and women are companions for each other, but a chicken, not a very good companion. Alligator, not, uh, not a very good, at least usually, good, I guess there's one that's a good companion. <laughs> he's trained him somehow, and he's warm and fuzzy, and it's a nice alligator. He's got to take him, his alligator with him when he goes places and so on, because that's his, uh, his emotional security blanket. But by and large, alligators don't serve that function very well. But dogs do. And we know that. We had a dachshund for 15 years, and a dachshund, dachshund died, had heart trouble and lots of problems. And we had to put it down. And that was one of the most traumatic events in my life. I never thought putting down a dog who was really suffering before he was put down, I never thought that it would be that emotional. And I just, it, and once we lost our dog, of course, we have to get another one. And uh, so we got one from the pound, and he had some bad experiences, and after he really almost took my thumb off, I thought, well, we didn't feel so bad. We actually felt pretty bad losing him as well. But on the other hand, we realized we had no choice. We brought company over, and he would growl, and this was a big problem. And he was on the streets for a year, they think, and just picked up a lot of bad habits. So some friends said, you need to get one from a breeder who's had no bad experiences. And so now we have a dog from the breeder, and everybody loves him. And he loves everybody. Company comes over, and instead of growling at them, he just, his tail wags like crazy, and he gets so excited, and he, he start licks them, and I guess that's how they let you know they love you. But he's, and just, people come over to see the dog. <laughs> and not us. Really. I'm going to come over, stop by your house, and say hi. Uh, yeah, your dog will be there, won't he? <laughs> oh, yeah, he'll be there. Okay, good, I'm coming over. So you can see, and now there are more dogs in the world than there are people. That's because a lot of people own several dogs. But there are enormous number of dogs. And so before God created man and woman, he had to create an animal that would be a perfect companion for man and woman, and that companion was a dog. And I go through that in detail of how the dog had to have certain traits and didn't have certain traits and so on in order to be a really good companion. Dogs are, for example, as you know, they're really good listeners. You, and they don't condemn. You talk to them for a half an hour, and they sit there, and they look at you, and you know they hear every word you say, but they don't sit there and say, oh, you're stupid. <laughs> or you ought to be ashamed of yourself with those thoughts. They're, I can see why no one likes you. <laughs> I mean, they, they just listen. They're good companions. On the plane coming over here, there were several people who had dogs, and so I said, well, you have a dog. You can bring that on a plane. He said, yeah, these are emotionally supportive dogs. I was in 
the war and I was, you know, saw a lot of my friends blown up and I suffered from post-traumatic stress syndrome and the most effective thing for me is that dog. And so now I have permission to take that dog wherever I go, including on planes. And he will sit with me on the plane when I travel. And that just reminds me of how important for so many people are, how important dogs are for so many people. So, so God had to think about creating dogs before he created Adam and Eve. And maybe that's why the animals were created before, of course, Adam and Eve were his last, the last creation. Earth's magnetosphere is a vast common-shaped bubble, plays a critical role in the planet's habitability. It shields our planet from solar and cosmic particle radiation, prevents erosion also of the atmosphere by solar wind. So the solar wind would, would force all the atmosphere, cause it to be lost. We have to have an atmosphere, and this magnetosphere protects the atmosphere. So you can see all these things are just hooked together. They're all necessary for the earth to be inhabited as it is today. Lightning, when I present this, and I presented this presentation probably, I don't know, 30 times, but this is the most amazing thing I mention, at least hey, people tell me that, and that is, why did God create lightning? Well, if you're a farmer, you know that. Lightning fixates nitrogen, changing it into a form that plants can use, and therefore, you don't have any lightning, eventually you're not going to have any plant life. You have to have lightning. Now, why isn't nitrogen just fixated, period? Well, if that was true, then we'd light a match and the whole earth would blow up. That would be a problem. Nitroglycerin is, of course, made out of nitrogen, and nitrogen is highly explosive in certain combinations. So the combination up there is in a form that's stable. It's very stable. But that's not usable by plants. Most plants, some plants can use it, but most can. So lightning produces fertilizer. And therefore, farmers pray for lightning. And when it comes, oh, thank God, the lightning. Oh, look at that light. Oh, that's so wonderful. And so now when you're out there in it, you probably don't think it's so wonderful, but the farmers certainly do. So uh, usually the farmers understand that, but it's surprising that a lot of us aren't aware of its importance. We have the nitrogen cycle. By the way, there are cycles of everything. We talk about that when we talk about waste. We should recycle everything. Well, when God designed the earth, guess what? Everything is effectively recycled. Everything. There's nothing that's not recycled. And I'll just mention a few common examples. Nitrogen, we have to have it for plants to grow, to make, to produce protein. And we have here just a chart of the cycle here where uh, nitrogen, of course, is given off by, say, power plants. Rain produces, it p pushes it down, ends up in uh, plants, plants grow, plants eventually decay. Nitrogen ends up part of the soil, the water, back in the water, the water evaporates, carries nitrogen up, and there's the nitrogen cycle. And that works pretty well if man doesn't mess it up too much. And there's the water cycle, which is probably more well known. And same thing, water evaporates, clouds, clouds produce precipitation, rain, rain ends up on the earth, in and, and the water, in ponds, in the ground, it's absorbed in the ground, we have groundwater, and eventually it all works back to the oceans. And the scriptures talk about the water cycle, the uh, hydrogen, H2O water cycle. And there's the water cycle again, another, another picture, which is probably a little bit better. The sun produces the energy necessary to produce evaporation, producing clouds, rains, and it ends up back in the ocean and lakes and rivers and streams. And round and round it goes, run by the power of the sun. So the sun runs, its job is to run the water cycle. Carbon cycle, same thing, same thing. Problem now is the carbon is not recycled effectively. And that's why there's a concern about global warming because we don't have the cycle operating as it should. And so what we need to do is just simply facilitate its proper operation, which it used to be. And uh, we also have heat recycling 
that uh, the land absorbs heat effectively. It gets hot, and the heat then rises, and then the wind, and wind also is necessary. You don't have wind, you don't have life. Without wind, eventually all the life will disappear, and then becomes cooler, loses the heat, and sinks, and then the oceans are cool, and the land is warm. So you have this constant breeze, and that's why living near water is so much more comfortable because it doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold. So the heat cycle is important as well. Without the heat cycle, we would be seven, eight hundred degrees on the land. So have to have a heat cycle in order to produce a climate which is reasonable for us. And the source of heat is, it surprises people, but uh, we have the sun, but we also have a nuclear power plant right below your feet. And when you talk about nuclear power, people get all upset and you say, well, then you'll have to leave the earth because right here, right here below you, right down there is a nuclear power plant. Right there, it's working. How do you know that? Dig a hole four, five, six feet almost anywhere and guess what? It's warm. Where does that heat come from? It comes from the center of the earth, part of it, but a lot of it comes from the radioactivity in the radioactive core here. And you can determine that by a Geiger counter. So you have to have this nuclear power plant right below us for the Earth's temperature to be moderated, necessary. And they call it the frost line. Where I live, it's about three feet, probably around here, three, three and a half feet. Below that, you never have frost, never freezes because of the heat from the nuclear power plant that you are sitting on or standing if you're standing. And volcanoes, volcanoes have a very important function. Volcanoes bring up minerals from the, you know, the elements we need, uh, lithium and uh, barium and, and uh, carbon and uh, chromium and vanadium and all these elements are necessary for plant growth. Where do they come from? Well, they're brought they have a lot in the soil, of course, but new levels are brought up by volcanoes, and volcanoes produce incredibly fertile land. And that's why in areas that were volcanic in the past, they're incredibly fertile far, farm land. So volcanoes are a critical means of fertilizing the earth. So thank God for volcanoes. They're necessary. In fact, plants need volcanoes, and planets without volcanoes probably don't have life, because we know volcanoes are necessary for life. When they erupt, of course, it's a problem, but just plan ahead and you're okay. You don't <laughs> build a house too close to a volcano. Uh, and normally the eruptions are pretty quiet, and every now and then we get, like Mount St. Helens, we get a really nasty eruption. but. Uh, I don't think there's too many people living near it, so we didn't lose, we got a lot of dust. But by the way, that dust now the, from the volcano is fertilizer. So we had massive fertilization through large parts of this part of the country as a result of that volcanic eruption. And there's a periodic table. God also had to create the elements. There was about 100 non-radioactive elements, and then there is a dozen or so radioactive elements and these elements, most of them, are necessary for life. Some we're not sure what they do, uh, but most of them we know they are important. Uh, arsenic, we don't think it's important for life, but we're not sure because arsenic is found everywhere, and therefore it's hard to know it's not important because it's in the water, it's in the air, it's in everywhere. And how they find out if minerals are important is they they hire college students and they pay them to go on a special diet. In the special diet, they remove something like vanadium. So the water they drink, the food they eat has no vanadium. And then eventually they get sick and we say, gee, you need to have this element. And that's how they, that's how they learn. And, but some elements, they're so needed in such small amounts, you can't do that research. Of course, some elements is pretty obvious. You need them. The carbon's pretty obvious. But uh, some elements, 
we've had to do the research to find out they're necessary. And just about every element we've looked at is necessary, but in very small amounts. And the elements are recycled very effectively. So if you try to produce an environment which doesn't have any mercury, you've got enough mercury in your body to last for a couple of years. So now we know some animals need, clearly they need mercury. But as far as we know, we don't, but we probably do. We just can't find out. So all the elements had to be created. So when God was creating the earth, he had to create all the elements. And they're still debated today where the elements came from. The conclusion was in a supernova is the origin of the elements. Now more and more research is finding that's not true. So we may end up in a position that God created all the elements from water specifically is the theory. And there you can see the most common elements in the crust, uh, iron, calcium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, titanium, hydrogen, all of these except aluminum. And aluminum may be important as well, but so far we don't have any evidence that aluminum is important. But the crust of the earth is made out of just the elements we need for plants. Plants pick them up. Plants are healthy. You eat healthy. I hope you eat healthy plants. The plants you eat are healthy, and therefore you get the elements. So the elements come through the system, but the origin of all the elements is the soil. There's a joke about uh, given enough time, life will evolve. We don't need God. And they say, well, you take soil and wait, 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 wait a minute. Make this, your God, make the soil. You can't, just, you can't eliminate the beginning. God started out with soil. You need to start out with soil in your theory of how the uh, life evolved. And so uh, that's important. And it's interesting. We, now we know, of course, the importance of soil. We know that Genesis is right. Indeed, you are the fruit of the soil. You are today. You are the fruit of the soil. It just goes through plants, and then you eat the plants, or animals eat the plants, and then you eat the animals the plants, and that's how you get the minerals from the soil. But of first, the origin of all the minerals is from the soil. There we go. What would happen if the moon disappeared? Well, moon's required for life, and the moon produces tides. Tides produces motion of the water. Motion of the water is important because if you think about it, the fish don't have the luxury of a private latrine. <laughs> In fact, fish don't even have bladders that stores urine. When fish have to go, they just go in the water. And so the water is the oceans and streams, etc. The water is not only lunch, it's also a sewer. It's also a sewer. And therefore, that's a problem, and so that problem is dealt with by movement of water. And you know if you have a, a body of water, there's no movement, it ends up killing the, the body of water. You get certain fungi that grow on there and, and so on, and it kills, the, kills the, the, the water source. So the water has to be moved, and the tides do that. So that's one function of the tides. The ocean currents diminish. Ocean life would as well. And in many ways, the ocean is like blood. If you think about it, blood contains food for life. It also contains waste products. So blood is also a sewer as well as lunch. It's a sewer. Your blood stream is a sewer. That's why you have kidneys to pull that bad stuff out. And kidneys remove it constantly because, well, otherwise the toxins in your blood would kill you. So that's why we have kidneys. When kidneys fail, you die. Or we have to have a, a mechanical dialysis kidney to has to have that function. You got to remove those toxins from the bloodstream. So the same thing is true of the earth. Loss of tilt would make most of the earth uninhabitable. If the earth spins faster, the day shorter be a problem, as we mentioned earlier. And, uh, and there we can see 23 and a half degree tilt, and that produces the seasons. If we didn't have that tilt. Part of the Earth the, near the equator would be uninhabitable. It'd be too hot. Part the poles would be uninhabitable because it'd be too cold. So we get temperate temperatures 
throughout most of the earth because of that tilt. So when they're looking for a planet that has life, got to have the tilt. Tilt is required. And the tilt produces, of course, seasons. And they got this all figured out. If the tilt didn't occur, how hot it would get in the poles, how cold in the poles, and how hot in the, the equator. And we couldn't survive without this tilt. And that is covered, I think, in the privileged planet. So then the creation days, of course, creation of plants and animals. There we go. And there's the animals. And last, created man. And of course, God realizes man is not meant to be alone. It's not good that man be alone. So God created the perfect, at least I think so, <laughs> the perfect companion, Eve. And when God created Eve, he finished his work, and he said, aha, the capstone of my creation was Eve. Now I am finished. I can't outdo Eve, and so therefore I stopped creating. Is that true, guys? How many of you guys would really have a hard time in life if you didn't have a spouse? Now, come on, be honest. Be honest. Many, in fact, studies have shown that longevity of a woman is important for longevity of a man. That women live longer than men, and one reason is that allows the man to live longer. Men who are single don't live as long as men who are married. In fact, one of the major factors in longevity for a male is his wife. If you have a good wife, you'll live longer. Okay? Very, very important. And uh, I have a whole presentation which I'll be given actually in a couple, well, actually a week, two weeks. And it's God created man and woman. And now we have this fad where men are in a man's body but think they're really a woman inside. And they call the surgeon. And that is now a fad where it used to be like zero point zero zero one percent and now it's like ballooned a thousand times or especially women who think they're in the wrong body I got this female body and I'm a male so they go through surgery and uh, hormone treatment and a lot of people think that's a problem well God created man and woman and it may not surprise you but men and women are different in everything we've looked at they've done research on the eyes, for example, you know women's eyes are larger than men's. They have better peripheral vision. They can see behind their, well, not exactly behind their back. But <laughs> they can see on the side. And when you look at the differences between men and women, it's obviously that women were created specifically to bear and take care of children. A man can't breastfeed a child. Only a woman can. And so therefore, a woman was created for her role, which is to have and take care of children. Men are created for their role, which is to help take care of their wife and their family. And I'll close this part with one last finding, and that is they've done surveys of what do you want in a mate? And they've asked people in like nine different countries, including the Arab countries, what is the main quality you want in a mate? And men and women clearly said, I want someone who is, what do you think? Is kind. Number one thing, men, men and women said, I want a, a mate who is kind. By far, number one. Number two now is a whole different world. Number two for a man was, they wanted a woman who was attractive. They, they wanted her physical appearance to be positive. The number two for a woman was they wanted a man who could support and take care of them. They want the option to work, but they you know, didn't want to have to work. They wanted to have choices, and they wanted a man who could support them and take care of them. And so that's throughout the world, Arab countries, France, Europe, America. It's amazing how similar they were. So we about time to take a break, I guess. And the second presentation I will give is shorter but it's on viruses. And the title is, 
you should, in your prayers every day, thank God for viruses. Because without viruses, you wouldn't be alive. And that's what the presentation's about. So uh, thank you very much. Along Barber Boulevard, 7421 Southwest Barber Boulevard. And I cannot quite tell you how to get there. I, I have been there myself. It's a, kind of a back street or something. I Sorry, I cannot help you how to get there, but it is 7421 Barber Boulevard. And I have called, and they are, op are open for dine-in seating so that is following our meeting today and again we will have q a time with dr bergman who is now going to enlighten us on the benefit of viruses sounds very interesting thank you okay there's a couple of slides several people said i should cover it right towards the end okay the next slide this was part of the previous presentation. And there we go. What do evolutionists believe? I've given you all this information, and what do evolutionists believe? Evolutionists believe that human existence is an accident based on totally random genetic mutations. So we've gone through all this. Can you believe, if you look at what evolutionists teach, can you believe that they actually believe this about the universe? And one thing and I could mention, I was an atheist at one time, and what convinced me, I didn't have a Pauline road to Damascus conversion experience. What brought me to Christ was studying Christ's works, his creation. I don't see how you can study the creation and not accept the fact that we have a creator. I just, it's, I, I just, I can't, I can't follow it. And uh, I, I critique evolution in my presentations, but by and large, a lot of the things that I look at are the wonders of the universe. Dawkins, Richard Dawkins teaches that humans were a happy chemical accident, and so is the universe. So all this came about by accident. So well, and they, they, when we say that, they say, oh, come on, we don't believe that. Well, they do, or many do. And there's not much difference between a gorilla and a human is the claim, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, there's a hand, and that's, you can, just in case you're not sure, <laughs> that's the human, and that's the gorilla. So there's a huge difference, and that's one thing I focus on in several of my books, the difference between the two. Okay, now we can do the next presentation. The reason I cover this is because one of the main arguments that atheists use, and I was part of them, I could tell you lots of stories about Madeline Murray O'Hara, O'Hare, by the way, uh, I, she was an interesting person. But uh, anyway, one of the main arguments they use is that how could there be a God if there's viruses? Why would God create such killers and viruses have killed millions of people? Why would God create viruses if he really existed? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. There must not be a God because otherwise he wouldn't, he wouldn't create viruses. Well, I got news for you. Viruses are really, really important. Like everything else, it's a few rogue viruses that went bad. Just like people do. They just, they go bad. And viruses, you got a few that go bad because of mutations. And this coronavirus, which we've been so concerned about the past year or so, evidently, that was, the theory now is that was modified by somebody. They put some genes in that virus called a gain of function, and as a result, those genes cause the problem. But otherwise, as far as I know, coronavirus has a nice, happy home in bats, and they do well together. In fact, you have billions of viruses in your body, and thank God you do because they serve a very important function. And that's what I'll cover in the presentation here. Okay, uh, the latest death rate to show you, indeed, some viruses have caused lots of problems. Uh, going way back here, uh, 20 million die from Black Death caused by virus, and all of these, and coronavirus is over here somewhere. So actually, it's not, it's more, 
more problematic than most in the past century, but we've got some way, way back that caused lots of problems, huge problems. And uh, coronavirus in Christ, there's a couple books basically say, said the same thing I'm saying, so you don't have to buy the books, you can just listen to my talk and <laughs> you know what I'm saying. But I worked with viruses in medical school, and so I know a fair amount. Why did God make viruses? It's based on the false idea that viruses cause disease and little else. Well, dogs cause disease too. And when I got bitten by my dog, I had to have a check for rabies. So therefore, all dogs are bad. Because some dogs ha carry virus and cause disease. Well, yeah, some dogs are bad, but most are not. Viruses, what are they? They are gene machines. They are not living. You can't kill a virus because they're not living. They are gene machines. They are a container with DNA in it, and they can't do anything until they get into your cell, and they use the mechanism in your cell to do everything they do, like make new copies of viruses. So the coronavirus gets in you, and it uses your cell and your gene machinery to make millions of copies, and that's how it spreads. And that's okay, because most viruses are good. Okay? You virus has trillions of viruses. Nobody knows, and actually we don't know much about those viruses because they don't cause a problem. How do you do research? You basically do research by looking at a problem. When I worked for medical school, we did research on cancer, and there's a lot of the cancers that kill a lot of people, but we needed to connect it with cancers that were popular. That means they have a lot of money and funds and cause a lot of damage, and so we basically chose breast cancer. Because if you're doing research on breast cancer, you can get lots of money. You can go from door to door and say, I'm doing research on breast cancer. And people say, yeah, my mother, my aunt, my friend died of breast cancer. Here's $1,000. So can, you can raise money. So we did research in other cancers, but we connected it to breast cancer to get money to do research. Because research is really, really important, obviously. And it's got to be something that's important. If I knocked on your door and I'm saying I'm doing research on the Povar virus, and uh, we're, we need to understand it. And you'd say, well, what, what is that? What is it? What is the cause? What disease? Well, it doesn't cause any disease. Well, then why are you researching it? Well, just curiosity. Look, I'm glad you have curiosity, but I give my money to people that are doing research on helping cure disease or something. I'm not, I don't want to spend money on people who want to find out something because of curiosity. And so you have to have a reason for doing research. Most viruses, there's five viruses in your eye right now that we know of, five viruses. And we don't know what they do, and we really don't care because they don't cause a problem, and we all have them. So uh, probably it does something important. I don't know. Maybe it kills bacteria. In fact, that's an important function of virus. They kill bacteria. That's a critically important of viruses. They kill bacteria. And maybe that's what they do in the eye. I don't know. And maybe when you get pink eye, maybe the problem is that the viruses that aren't doing their job. So that's why you get pink eye. Well, we don't know, but we know you need viruses in your body. Okay, and there's a virus, and you can see the parts. All it is, it's got a core here, and then it's got uh, RNA called retroviruses, or DNA, which uh, is, it can be used for, uh, for, for the genes, basically. And they have the genes they need to make parts of the virus, and they use your cellular machinery to make new viruses. And one of the most important things are these things that stick out of there. And that's kind of like a driver's license. When flying today, I had to pull out my driver's license and show, prove who I was. Well, the viruses have this identification. And that way, when they get in your body, your body knows whether they're friend or foe. And if you're a friend, they leave it alone. And that's good because most viruses are friend. And therefore, they say, oh, you're friend. You're OK. No problem. The coronavirus, your body has to discover it's a foe, and then it builds up an immune response. And then when the coronavirus gets in your body again, then your body says enemy, and it's already got a system set up to kill the virus. And that's why I could have had the coronavirus several times, and I didn't know it because the body took care of it so quickly. In fact, most people who get the coronavirus don't even know they had it. It tested the population. They think about 20 to 30 percent of everybody has had the coronavirus and didn't even know they were sick. See, you know, you have, you're immune to the coronavirus. You had the coronavirus. I did, really, when? 
Well, when did I have it? I don't know. You must have had it because you've got the antibodies for it. So you must have had it, but some people, I had a friend, he's got all kinds of health problems, and uh, he had the coronavirus, and he said, the only symptom I had, I was tired, just really tired a lot, and I, and I had no other problems. And that's common for many people. People who have problems with coronavirus typically have other problems, as you know. So, uh, okay, there's the... And viruses come in an enormous variety of shapes. In fact, some are really, I don't pretty. I, when I study this guy, and that's a virus, and he lands on your cells like a rocket ship, and he's got a needle here, and he injects the DNA into your body through this rocket ship, and the needle then gets the DNA in the body and causes a problem. Now, actually, this virus here only kills bacteria. It doesn't affect you. You've got all these, you've got thousands of these in your body right now doing all kinds of good work, but they only kill bacteria. It's called a bacterial phage. And so some people, the reason they have a problem with bacterial infections is they don't have enough of these guys. They need more of these guys to deal with the infection. In fact, a major function, as I said, of viruses is to kill bacteria. On the other hand, you know you need bacteria as well. You need the good ones. In fact, now you have a lot of foods they recommend you can you ingest because they have the good bacteria like yogurt and, and uh, sour things like sauerkraut and so on. They have a lot of good bacteria and therefore you need to have them as part of your diet because you need bacteria, but you have a few rogue bacteria just like you have a few rogue viruses, just like you have a few rogue people. So no difference at all. Anyways, when you look at these through the microscope, it's amazing. They just look like, like designs, like Christmas tree ornaments. It's just amazing how beautiful some are, especially this guy. This guy has always been a fascination uh, for us because of how his design looks like a rocket ship. And then you got some viruses that look like pencils. Pretty boring. They're gene machines. What do they do? They basically carry DNA or RNA. RNA would be, of course, a retrovirus. They carry DNA or RNA to cells, and the cell, your cells, animal cells, make new copies of the virus. And that's what they do. Viruses are designed to utilize your ribosomes, your tRNA, your translation factors, etc., to synthesize protein. So they synthesize proteins and make new viruses. But it's amazing they can use all your machinery, your machinery and your cells, to make new copies of themselves. But that's what they do. And what were they designed for? Well, they are the workhouse of molecular biology. Almost all the work we do in molecular biology, which is study disease and cancer and so on, almost all of it's done by viruses, specifically lambda virus, because it's a big virus. We got lots of room. We can take stuff out and put new stuff in. So if we want to get a gene in your body, and they're now doing this more and more, if we want to get a gene in your body, we put it in a lambda virus. Lambda virus goes in and it drops this gene off in your cells, and we end up treating diseases by the use of these viruses. It's experimental to some degree, and especially cancer, they're looking at this. But I think in the near future, or already now, these will be an important means of curing disease, viruses. And that's one function that they have. And we also use them to modify plants, animals, and all life. In fact, most of the food you eat probably is genetically modified. Who does that? Viruses do. We get a gene that we want that makes your food to taste better or whatever, and we put it in the virus. The virus brings it in the plant, and we have genetically modified food. In fact, most food is genetically modified, except in the old-fashioned way, we just interbreed. We splice two plants together, and we use an other techniques. But essentially, the food supply today, almost all of it is genetically modified. Crab apples are now big, juicy apples, and eventually we produced new strains from, originally, crab apples. 
Except at first it was done, you know, you got a little bit fatter crab apple, another little fatter crab apple, and you breed them together, and eventually we got these big, nice, juicy, juicy apples. So I don't know any food that's not genetically modified. It's just now we do it differently. And now we're you know, not, not always it's accurate. Okay, viruses are the basis for rapidly growing genes. We produce a lot of new genes by viruses. They make copies of genes, so when we need a certain gene, the virus can make the copy. And gene therapy, we talked about that. And genetically modified foods, we talked about that. Bacteriophages attack only bacteria, not human cells. And it keeps the bacteria number in check without harming the human host. If you didn't have bacteriophage, bacteria would eventually take over your body and you would die. So you need the bacteriophage to keep the bacteria in check. Because bacteria grow so rapidly, it's said within a 24-hour day, two bacteria could reproduce enough to cover the earth in bacteria. Now they can't do that because they run out of food or bacteriophage kills them or other means of control. And there, in case I have friends who don't believe viruses exist, they really don't believe they exist, and I say, I've seen them in the lab through electron microscope. They're really there. They really exist. And we got pictures of them. And right here is a tobacco mosaic virus. And right here is a, I uh, can't read that. Adenovi adenovirus, okay, adenovirus, causes colds. And there's the spikes. You see the spikes out of there? And this would be, uh, okay, influenza, which causes the flu. And here's our friend, the bacterial phage. And this is T4, lots of these. And this is T4. So, and now we can see drawings. So we can see how, you, when you look at these, in fact, I know of people who looked at the virus and said there has to be a God. Has to be a God. Specifically, the bacterial phage, Michael Behe, who you've all heard of, he he came involved in intelligent design because he looked at the bacterial phase and says there has to be a God. It can't evolve. There's no evidence of it's evolving. There must be a creator that made that that way. Because when you look at it, it's just incredible. And there are some pictures. There is indeed a drawing of what's in it. And there's actual photographs of this bacterial phase through the electron microscope. They're really small, of course. They fit on bacteria, and bacteria, of course, are fat compared to these guys. And they're a drawing of the parts of it. And there we can see is a bacteria. And there you can see the bacterial phase are invading and killing this poor guy. He's done. He's going to be history. And then his body parts will be broken down and recycled. Without this control, bacteria would soon take over the world. And the story they used to illustrate this is about every microbiology class, which I used to teach, the king's reward. The king was going to honor one of his great servants and said, the servant really made some major progress in the kingdom. And he said, I will give you anything you want. What will it be? And the man said, well, Monday, give me a plate with one seed on it. Tuesday, a plate with two seeds. Wednesday, four seeds. Thursday, eight seeds. 16 seeds. 32 seeds. For a year. The king said, is, is that all you want? Is that all you're asking for? Well, he was smarter than the king. And he bankrupted the kingdom because pretty soon every grain of the seed was his. And so, hey, when you're rewarding somebody for being really, really smart, you got to be careful. <laughs> they might fool you. And we even know the dimensions of these guys. 100 nanometers. From here to here is 100 nanometers. The sheath evolved at 100 nanometers as well. And the tail fibers, we've got all this worked out. So we know the details. So it bothers me when people say viruses don't exist. Something else is causing the coronavirus. It's not, a, it's not due to a virus. Well, guess what? And that here we see the DNA of the virus. We know all the parts. 
we can say here we've got this gene, there we've got that gene, we've got all the parts all mapped out. And we know which ones, and this is probably, this is my guess of what happened to coronavirus. We had some genes here that were not useful, and they pulled them out, and they replaced it with genes that caused the coronavirus to be more virulent, to spread faster. Now, the reason they, my theory is, I don't have any inside information, but from what I know about it, because I did that same work, from what I know about it, what they were trying to do is create a really virulent virus and then come up with a way of treating it. So before it spreads and causes a problem, we'll produce one and then we'll learn how to treat it and then when the real virus comes along, we're all set. And what happened, I believe, is that, although this was poo-pooed at first, but now it's more and more mainstream, what happened was is that they had this virus in the lab, and this lab was supposed to be a level five, and I understand it wasn't. And therefore, somebody got one, the virus on their hand or their coat or something, and it went outside and spread throughout the world within a matter of hours. And I think that's what happened. It was just a mistake. And we deify science. We keep saying, follow the science. And, uh, well, it looks like following the science is a problem because one study said wear masks. You've got to wear masks. There are four studies which have done recently which all the studies found masks don't help at all. Now, they're limited studies. There's only for uh, two or three days and only a couple of thousand people. But nonetheless, the four came up with the same conclusion. And when I, I have a Master of Public Health and we studied all this, I learned about the problem of hypercapnia. And you wear these masks too long and you end up with hypercapnia. That means too much carbon dioxide and that can cause a problem. Okay, and that's why uh, some people had a hard time wearing the mask. And uh, would, I guess the government feels better safe than sorry. And yeah, they may be a waste of time, but they might help, and so let's require everybody to wear a mask. But they kept saying, the science says, well, the science can't speak. Scientists speak, and scientists have wrong ideas, and this is, I wrote an article about this for my the website, Crevo Evo, C-R-E-V, I think Evo, E-V-O. But I talked about uh, this is a good example because scientists say that, you evolve from apes. The science proves evolution. The science uniformly says we evolved. Evolution is true. So follow the science. So you guys are all science rejectors. You all reject science. Well, that's what they say. That's one way of name calling us, and I would be a science rejector as well because the evidence is overwhelming that evolution is not true. It never happened. It never could happen. And we know that from the science. So all my books are written on, based on the science. And I have hundreds or thousands of references showing you where I got the science from. Now, why don't scientists agree talking about this during the break? Why don't scientists acknowledge this? Well, the reason they don't is because they believe in evolution. It's a belief. And once people believe something, it's hard to change their mind. I have a good friend who's a nurse, an RN, a bright person. She doesn't believe viruses exist. And I have been unable to convince her. These pictures were all faked. This were all, these are all drawings people do, but I worked with viruses. They work. We're able to get genes into other creatures, etc., and they work. I don't know how you, I don't believe in viruses. I don't believe they exist. I've never seen one. Well, if you go through channels and look through electron microscope, you can see them. Well, I'm not going to bother that. Why should I bother that? Because they don't exist. Why should I look at something that's not there? Well, if you look at it, you'll see they're there. I'm not going to bother. And so I think with this issue, uh, my book, uh, Useless Organs, Refuted, where did I get the information? We had about 100 claims of useless organs. This was a major argument for evolution for a century. 100 claims of all these organs had no function. And all I did is I went to the library and I just did a lot of research and I found, guess what, they all have very important functions. Just look up the literature. I don't have to, you know, think about what could they could do. We, we know what they do. The most interesting one is Aplica semiluminarius, which they claim was a vestigial. 
we knew it had a very important function in 1928. And I quote that reference because that's one of the best references which found that the Plica Semiluminarius, it's, it, it's not a Plica Semiluminarius, it's a very important part of the eye and has a very important function. And they discovered that in 1928. And why it isn't that commonly known? Well, because the, the scientists haven't read my book yet. <laughs> they read my book, they would know. And they could look up the article in the 1928 Science Journal, and they could learn what, indeed, they found. So anyways, before antibiotics, much research was on bacteriophages as a treatment. In fact, in some countries today, I understand this, in Russia, Georgia, the country of Georgia, and Poland, they still use phages as a treatment for bacterial infections. You got a bacterial infection, we need some viruses, We'll give you a shot of these viruses, and the viruses will kill the bacteria. In fact, if you're immune or allergic to certain or many types of antibacterial agents, they ought to try that in this country. And I don't know why they don't. Maybe we should learn something from Poland and, and Georgia and Ukraine and uh, Russia. They work very, very well. And if I, like I'm allergic to tetracycline, I can't take any tetracycline drugs. A lot of people are allergic to penicillin. So what do you do? You have to use another drug. What if you're allergic to all the existing drugs? Well, there you go. You may have to go to Russia to get treated. And why we don't use that here, I don't know. And uh, many biologists, by the way, want to bring back the phage approach if antibiotic resistance is a problem. So your doctor may write you a prescription for viruses instead of penicillin. And uh, must invade the living cell. In the sea alone, we take a glass of seawater, one glass of seawater, and it has about 150 million viruses in that glass of seawater. So if you've ever been swimming and swallowed some seawater, you may have picked up a couple of billion viruses most of which don't cause a problem. And uh, the problem, though, is why do we have rogue viruses? The problem is the viruses mutate. And they, th well, with coronavirus, that was a human, we think, human-produced mutation. But they normally mutate in nature, and that's why you have some viruses that cause a problem because they're mutated. So in the bacteria, they don't cause a problem. They have a host. Sorry, in uh, bats or other animals, there's no problem. But they have a mutation. They get out from the bats. They infect people, and then there's a problem. So originally in the creation in Adam and Eve, no viruses would cause a problem. The only reason that viruses cause a problem today is because of mutations. So they mutant, and we have a mutant form. In fact, they call them mutant forms. The coronavirus is a mutant form. So that's the problem. In their proper host, there's no problem. Now also, they can be in their proper host and then move from a proper host to you and cause a problem because you're not their host. And that can be a problem as well. Thank God for viruses. They serve as vectors. Again, we worked with them all the time at the medical school. I heard that lambda virus, lambda virus, lambda. I got the new lambda virus today. Oh, you're going to work with the lambda virus. Until, don't say the word lambda again, I'm tired of it. Worked with it constantly. And they offer the potential, in fact, some success now to cure cancer, correct for genetic disorders. In fact, the only cure for type 1 diabetes is viral. And hopefully that'll catch on. There's research now, but you don't release it until you know for sure it doesn't cause a problem. So you have an idea which may work, it does work, but it takes years before you know it is no prob not problematic, before you know it's not a problem. And so that's why some of these take so long to come to market. And viruses are used in many genetic studies.
to determine molecular mechanisms. So much of what we know about your cell, we learn through viruses. So you, I can't see how you can do molecular biology, biological research without uh, working with viruses. So thank God for virus, the good kind, not the mutant forms. Those are the kinds you have to be aware of. How many viruses cause disease? Actually, only a handful. And we usually name the disease after the virus or vice versa. So we have the adenoviruses, colds, and flu, and so on. So they're very specific. And many viruses, by the way, only have keys to get into a certain cell. The best example is, is the, the AIDS virus. And to get into the T cells, it has to have two keys. Otherwise, it can't get in. It has to have two keys. If it has one key, it can't get in. So what happened is, is some people have the site there, the key hole, it's damaged, and therefore, it's only got one key hole, so the virus can't get in there because it's got to have both keys, and it may have both keys, but if they don't have both key holes, it can't get in. So it's kind of like two locks on your door. It can't get in unless I have two keys. So it's the same thing. That ensures God designed that to ensure that the wrong virus didn't get into your cells. And so that's um, evidence of design. Again, we live in a fallen world, and I think one major reason for the fallen world is mutations. Not only in you, which cause cancer, but also in viruses and bacteria and everything else. So mutations are evidence of a fallen world. And I might add, what is the main source of genetic variety that evolution uses to select from mutations? So you are, according to evolution, you are the result of billions of mutations. Isn't that a nice thing to say? You're the result of billions of mistakes. Well, I don't buy that. That's why I think evolution is, is false. We have some Q&A now. Yes, we have some Q&A time. And coronavirus, of course, is kind of a hot topic, and there are some very strong political feelings about that. But if we could please try to keep the politics out of this this morning, if that's possible. And I see a hand over here. I think you were first. Is that right? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. All right. So from your first talk, you showed the slide with an arrow pointing towards our solar system and uh, said that the, that was ideally located. I just wonder if you take a moment and explain why. What okay, difference would it make if it was somewhere else? Rather than give 10 reasons, I'll just give a couple. One is we can't be too close to other stars. And most stars are two together. One star orbits the other, basically. And that's not going to work for a solar system. So we can't be too close to other stars. We have to be far away from other stars. On the other hand, if we're too far from other stars, night would be night. You ever been in a cave and they turn the lights off and you experience for the first time in your life really darkness? You cannot see your hand when it's right in front of your face. I mean, it's totally dark. You can be in there for an hour and you see nothing. Totally dark. Well, it would be totally dark at night if we didn't have any stars. Stars are very important to, to light the night. And therefore, we need to be close enough to lots of stars, but not too close to any stars. Otherwise, we'd have a binomial star system, and that's not going to work for our... And there are other reasons, too, because stars give off uh, radiation. And too close to certain stars, we'd have too much radiation, which would kill life. So we have to be in the sweet spot of the uh, Milky Way galaxy. And this is all in standard astronomy books, so what I brought out in the presentation is nothing new. It's all there. The difference is, is I draw from the knowledge implications. When I taught astronomy, I taught all the same stuff, no problem, but I could not legally bring up the implications. I just had to say, well, we're just lucky. Just a lot of luck. That's why we're here. If we were somewhere else, there wouldn't be life on the planet. So, so it wouldn't be life on the planet because, well, we, we wouldn't be able to evolve on the other planets. So 
we're just we're lucky to be where we're at. Okay, we have another question over here. You want to stand? Okay, stick our mic. So, as I understand it, a lot of research in since the sequencing of the human genome has led to a lot of research in heritable traits in the cytoplasm. Am right. I, am I close on that. So my question would be then, are some of the immune responses that are learned as in response to the virus now, is that something that might be based on science's research that's known now, 